Well, good evening. I hope you had a good night's sleep on our first night of our holiday, and I hope we didn't give you anything too disturbing to sort of disturb your dreams. You know, I wouldn't want to do that. Far be it from me to do that. Anyway, today I've had a really nice uh, day. I've uh, got my first takeout coffee today from Lost and Found. And to get the real taste of that sort of coffee, you know, I feel as though life's moving into holiday mode all right. And I have a tonics tea cake here just ready to launch into when we finish our little time this morning, or this evening actually. But let's continue, and here I just want to give you some background information. First of all, we don't use all the names. Whenever Frances is writing to her family back home and to her circle, as she calls it, uh, she uses initials and her family know who they are. Maybe you do that sort of thing in your journal, you know, you write, Dear Journal, I met B today and I had a chat with C and so on, and maybe B is your boyfriend, you know, and you don't want anybody to know who the present boyfriend is or whatever. And so um, things like that. Her language might be a little bit 19th century because she was 19th century, so we're not going to change any of that. I want you to get the feel for this as though you're right there in her world at that time. So we're visiting these places, 18 and 71, and it's just after the Franco-Prussian War. And the Franco-Prussian War left a lot of devastation, obviously in France and in, in parts of Prussia and in that area. You want to try and get a sense of that, and that's what she's going to do. So here we begin, June the 29th, not far away from our time of the year, so that's nice. And she writes this as she says, Sitting in an arbor outside the station at Belfort, the only strong place left to the French in this region. And she writes, Dear Miriam, We have had a most interesting journey, and I feel quite historical. We crossed from New Haven with a crowd of returning French and reached Dieppe about 9.30 a.m., had coffee, and they, we went on via Rouen, to Paris. H.C. would be charmed with Rouen, and I bracketed it with Edinburgh and Bern as the three most picturesque towns I know. We had just time to go via the Rue Jean d'Arc to St. Ouen, which is a crystallization of all one's floating visions of lovely architecture. And here I pause, by the way, if I crucify any of your French, just forgive me, you know. I had a little splendid stock of French books and tracts which we were able to divide between us for distribution and we gave many away. You cannot think how delighted people seemed. One tall, serious man of a superior rank watched us and came up asking if we had many books. We were afraid to interfere as he looked very official. However, he only wanted to ask if we would kindly give him one for himself and two if we could. He took them and he thanked us as if we had given him something really special. We left Rouen at 2 p.m. and made friends with two very talkative French girls returning to Paris after the war. One of them had immense lovely eyes. They told us all sorts of war experiences. One had an uncle in La Roquette who escaped by bribing the guard the night before he was to be shot. Her own house left standing and untouched, but the houses on each side burnt to a shell. The other had a brother who had three horses killed under him, but escaped unwounded. A cousin was killed in the first battle. An uncle escaped from his chateau two minutes before the communiste entered and killed three men instead of him. This girl said her family had lost nearly all her property. The other had fared better. They both reviled the emperor and said it was all his fault. He was resolved to go to war purely in order to preserve his own dynasty. But they would not own that the communists were French altogether. It was bad, the bad of all countries who constituted the communists and they disowned them as compatriots. As we neared Paris, they pointed out where the line had been broken up, and soon after we crossed the Seine by two bridges, an island being in the middle. 
Of the most fragile and temporary looking appearance, these bridges, at about two miles an hour with awful squealings of the engine all the time. The ruins of the broken bridge were about 50 yards higher than us. Then we saw the war effects visible and terrible. For some miles, all through those bright looking suburbs, it was just a succession of desolation. Great ragged holes in the roofs and walls of some houses and other mere shells, gutted entirely, and others laid open like the front of a baby house, a whole wall having fallen and showing the skeleton of the stories. It was far worse than I expected to see, and the two French girls were sadly distressed and flushed, and their pretty eyes were full of tears. We felt so sorry for them. At Paris, 4.20, we couldn't get a taxi, and we walked with a porter about a mile and a half to the station for Basel via Troyes. Most of the way was just Paris of the old, gay and clean and lively. But here and there, there were pitted houses with bullet marks, and over nearly all the churches, we saw the mark of the communists in large lettered Liberté, Egalité and Fraternité. At the Rue Strasbourg station, we decided to go by the night train and meantime set off to see the more special ruins. We walked nearly two miles before we could find a vehicle and then drove to Tullier. The principal walls are standing, but through the burnt out windows, I noticed especially the superb rooms I went through with you. Not a floor or a cross wall was left. And then the gardens, they looked so knocked about, and soldiers' tents, they looked so queer and ominous. The Palais Royal seemed much the same, and the stumpy pedestal of the Colonne Vendôme looked most melancholy. Our driver was a communist, I fancy, and a lively one, because when we bemoaned what we saw, ha, he laughed and said, it's all right, sure that makes for work for the labourers. He showed us the Colon Vendôme that was, with the absolute glee, and said, Oh, we have taken that down, but we might put another one up. Where's the money come from, I said, for all of this? Oh, he said, there's always enough money forthcoming when you want it. Were you in Paris during the siege, we said? Surely, he said, this is my country, it's my Paris. The unsubdued, cared-for-not look of the man gave us a notion of French levity. He showed us the Rue de la Paix, where the awful massacre began, and the bullet marks on the houses. In contrast to all this, the boulevards, they just looked as gay as they were in 18 and 69, crowded and bright. No end of people drinking coffee and wine at the little tables under the trees. Theatre placards in all directions, and all just as usual, only much less colourful. For we took special notice that at least seven out of the eight women were in mourning, wearing black. This was most striking and a great contrast to the colours of 1869. We also saw a good number of dirty and dismal looking soldiers. And we were told that these were returned French prisoners coming in by every train. We left Paris by 8 p.m. train and arrived at Belfort at 9 a.m. in the morning, nearly an hour late. All before this is in Prussian hands, so the French officials don't or they won't know anything about it and show no timetables and give no answers but shrugs to any question or they just refer to one of those Germans at the other end of the station. It's quite sadly comical. We both vote a journey at night a great success and after 9.30 we had the carriage to ourselves and we were quite luxuriously comfortable. Mrs. Mrs. Snep, who was one of our con travelling companions, she gave me a hood which is a great comfort and E admires it extremely. The guard was most polite and though he did not resort to the simple expedient of locking us up, he took the trouble to warn people off if they were coming near our carriage at all. In fact, one unadvised individual opened our door and the guard rushed at him with a marsh ten. 
Il y a du madame. Marsh 10. <laughs> well, we don't know whether we slept much because we seemed to be aware of the stations, most of which there was a tremendous hullabaloo occasioned by soldiers returning from Prussia. We were quite roused up at 3.30 and we fell upon gingerbread and biscuits and then subsided until after six. When we got up for food and for good and found ourselves nearing the then crossing the lovely Vosges mountains. One of the problems out here is that you'll get the odd bug floating around, but that's just like you would if you were up in the mountains, in the Vosges mountains. I forgot to say that between twilight and moonlight, about 9 p.m., we passed a most desolate and scathed region, and we were told that it was the battlefield of Champigny. Anything grimmer and gloomier you could not imagine. The ground was broken and scarred. Nothing but weeds were growing. Maybe a few deserted cottages with great gaps in roofs and ball marks with great cracks radiating from them in the walls. And many terrible, terrible irregular shaped mounds at irregular distances where heaps of dead were buried just where they fell. It was so ghastly and it made war so very real. After we had breakfasted there, we sauntered towards the fortifications. We distributed little Christian books as we went along. We never had such a time of it. The people were so eager after them, we only wished that we'd had hundreds more. Several superior people came and asked for them, though we often only offered them to the poor. Some asked for another to give to a friend. One workman at the fort seemed delighted and he begged us to give some for his fellow workmen. There were a great many at work above, he said and they would be so glad of them. We went into a place where some wounded soldiers and some women were, working at, were sitting and working. They spoke most gratefully, and they rose and they abode. They bowed, saying, Merci infiniment, infiniment, said one man. We exhausted our stock, and uh, having pottered about the fortifications, we parted. As E wished to go further, and I came to, back to write, I then passed through the town and found lots of people on the lookout for me to ask for more little books. At one point, at, th at least 30 people were clustered around me, begging for more. I had only three French hymns left. They were so disappointed that after talking a little to them, I told them if they came to the station, we might get some more. We took the opportunity, for plenty of people give tracks on the Swiss routes, but here they are an evident novelty. Belfort is terribly battered about. The large church is just a ruin. Not a square yard of the roof is whole. The houses nearest the fort are simply heaps of ruins. The weather is just warm enough to be pleasant for sitting out of doors without a wrap. E and I are mutually satisfied with all we have, and we have nothing but what we can carry ourselves on emergency, and it's great, it's so delightful. We have been first come, first served several times already. The unprotected female line answers first rate. Everyone is civil and attends to us. I hope somebody, hope somebody will write to us at Zermatt. I ought to get some encouragement to write my circulars. Love all around in general. Your loving sister, 